Hello and welcome to episode number 22 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value no matter where you are on your musical journey. If you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. And if you've been listening to this program and getting some kind of value out of it, I'd like to ask you to rate and leave a comment about it on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And I want to thank you in advance for that. My guest this week is Dr. Lisa Brooks, Dean of the Jordan College of Arts and Professor of Violin at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, where she is also the principal second violin of the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra. But I got to know Lisa primarily through working together in the recording studios in Indianapolis and performing on a short-lived chamber music series that I founded. She's one of the most thoughtful musicians I know with a broad perspective on the industry as a player and educator. We had many great chats over the years, sharing a stand in the studio and over coffee and styrofoam cups during the recording breaks. And in reconnecting with her for this episode, and since she's been promoted first to chair of the music department and then to dean in 2017, she has grown into a powerful advocate for and reformer in her institution. Lisa clearly articulates a dynamic vision for her college, one that integrates the university into the community through partnerships and public-minded programming, one that cultivates good citizens and good leaders who may go on to a career in their artistic fields or something else entirely. Ultimately though, the college serves both its students and its community and is both forward-thinking and lays a solid educational foundation. And the idea that an institution can be both teacher and servant is, I believe, a hallmark of the 21st century institution, where we can be measured with a long-term vision, or as the author Hugh Hecklow describes it, thinking institutionally, and still be responsive to contemporary culture and to changing community needs. Lisa and I spent some time talking about how arts institutions can help repair the fabric of American society. And as it turns out, we recorded this interview on the morning of January 6th wrapping up not long before a protest in Washington, D.C., morphed into a riot, and then a grotesque insurrection. That day's events only reinforced the correctness of what Lisa described and her observations that liberal arts schools are perhaps better positioned than conservatories. Curriculum and programming that prizes breadth is better positioned than one of excess commitment and narrowness, that in reality is more rigid, then it is steadfast. My own feelings are that large nonprofit institutions can't simply be in the business of baseline mission fulfillment. Our products and services are means, not ends. And there are no ends in forming a more perfect union. There are no solutions. There are only amendments and course corrections. Any student of our nation's history knows that America can be many things to many people at once. America is not America if it's not in flux. And American institutions should always be a place of stability within that churning society, but not at the expense of renewal. There were a few lines in an article that stuck with me in the conservative paper, The Washington Examiner, after the events at the Capitol. Quote, If you're not willing to trust an authority, you'll never arrive at certainty about very much in this life especially in our massive country and this age of high technology. Yet, in an increasingly deinstitutionalized culture, more and more people are trying to craft a bespoke understanding of the world. Helping to understand the world or understand our communities or simply give a glimpse into the lives of our fellow Americans and neighbors is the essential work of arts institutions. And institutional renewal comes through the kind of patient and committed work that Lisa describes. As our representatives went back to the nation's business once the Capitol was cleared, I reread several passages from American historians for some perspective. And this one from Jill Lepore's These Truths resonated with me the most. The United States began with an act of severing, 
The American experiment has not ended. A nation born in revolution will forever struggle against chaos. A nation founded on universal rights will wrestle against the forces of particularism. A nation that toppled a hierarchy of birth to erect a hierarchy of wealth will never know tranquility. A nation of immigrants cannot close its borders, and a nation born in conquest will fight forever over the meaning of its history. Please enjoy this interview with Lisa Brooks. Dr. Lisa Brooks, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Rob. How are you? <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm the son and grandson of educators. And when I went off to school, I always imagined that I would go through and get a DMA and maybe go out on the uh, college teaching circuit. But, um, and I was on that path, actually. I had a really fantastic studio teacher and I stayed with him in my master's program um, after undergrad. And I was a teaching assistant in my master's program. But I actually had a sort of an ongoing negative relationship with another professor in the school. Um, nothing too contentious, but enough that I had a particular incident that I've remembered very clearly for years where after it was over, it was a fairly benign thing, but I went home and said, I'm switching my focus. And sort of that day, I changed my trajectory and focused exclusively on orchestra auditions. And I'm wondering if you had kind of the 180 degree experience from that, where you had some really formative experience or some um, inflection point along the way that said, I want to follow this career path. I want to get the terminal degree. I want to be a professor. So no, no, I didn't actually. Um, so I, I had a kind of similar childhood feeling because my mother was a nurse. She was an RN. So I always thought I would be a nurse. Mm. And it wasn't until I got into high school and realized that people were you know, paying me to play the violin and like, hey, that's fun. Maybe, maybe I'll actually do that. Mm -hmm. I decided to go into music as a and music performance, violin performance. But again, I'm not, I'm not the traditional path even into high school in that I started in public school in, in Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from. You start in fourth grade. They, they do an interview with you. I was very tall at those, you know, in that day and age, mm -hmm. I was considered tall. So, hey, you're going to play the bass. And uh, no, I'm not going to play the bass because we had a family violin. And so I was going to play the violin and didn't start studying privately till 10th grade. So I had a little bit of a different trajectory. Um, and simultaneous to that in high school, and it's hard to imagine when you consider me now, but I was a major athlete. Mm -hmm. So I graduated with seven varsity athletic letters in three different sports because that's what you did back then. You played the sport in season. Mm -hmm. um, so I had, to, I, you know, I played the violin, but I was also this athlete. And so when it was time for college, you know, I started privately in tenth grade. As I said, my teacher had gone to Catholic U, so I auditioned at Catholic U, and uh, she wanted me to audition at a conservatory, so I auditioned at Manhattan. And then I had friends at West Virginia University, so I auditioned there. And for, you know, I didn't know how to practice. I didn't know, I was really not very serious. I mean, I had a certain degree of talent and, and natural facility and was a musical player, never, you know, never a big talent certainly. But so I, I went to West Virginia University, which is not exactly known for, you know, it's, it's music program, but it was a big program and I got a full scholarship. And so off mm -hmm. I went there. But to your point about then with the sort of pivot to even just college teaching. That wasn't really until I met my husband, I met Davis, um, as, a, as a, we were stand partners in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania Symphony. He was the concertmaster. And he was finishing his doctorate. And he was teaching at Bucknell University as a visiting professor. And so after we had been married for about two years, it was like, well, maybe we should do academia. Just felt, you know, we were thinking about having a family and it just, you know, he, we were sort of living in New York and freelancing and boy, that, that doesn't feel very long-term sustainable financially. So I went back to school and got my doctorate and we entered the academic path at that point. Were the sports and music, were they ever in tension with each other at some point in high school? <laughs> you mean like when I broke my finger playing basketball? That would be one of the things the, that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, and then trying to like hide that from my teacher uh, who had never done anything athletic you know, tried, took the thing off the finger and played. Fortunately, it was the ring finger of my bow hand. So I could just be like across the room and it was sticking straight out. She did not notice for a long time, but uh, she, yeah, she had this image that if I didn't do that, I would take all that time and practice the violin. Mm -hmm. And she didn't understand that, no, that wasn't going to happen. I was going to, I needed to be an athlete as much as I needed to play the violin. 
You yeah. know, so so much of that time in life, though, uh, with both with sports and, and music, that there's often a family member or a guidance counselor of some type that is saying that these things are avenues to college. Yeah. And did you kind of see both those things as potential avenues to college? No. No, again, I, and I think I think that's just the difference in our generations like that, that kind of counseling or that idea of like if you play the bassoon, you'll get a scholarship to, you know, mm -hmm. that that was not a part of my upbringing. And I, I think it was generational and time and, and those kinds of things. I, you know, I did the things I wanted to do. And, and I had, in, in, and you can remember high school, probably if you went to a public high school where, you know, the orchestra click and like the athlete click were not really, those mm -hmm. were, you know, there's no real Venn diagram that makes those two things intersect very much. And of course I, I was taking all honors courses. So that group was more with the music group, but not the athlete group. And, so I, I was kind of traveling my own, my very own little path there. Um, but I, I don't remember, actually, I don't remember having a high school guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. And it was really my violin teacher who took me to these gigs. And as I say, people were paying me. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe I'll just do that. You know? That's interesting. So obviously there was very little interpersonal overlap in those groups. But yeah. did you, even at that time, did you see an overlap in terms of um, discipline or work ethic or anything like that, that yeah. kind of those things overlapped? Sure. I, I, I absolutely. Do you bring any of that to your teaching? I mean, do you, do you use sports metaphors in your teaching? Yeah, I do. I do. Whether it's, it's physically like, you know, like trying to talk about a bow change and talk about throwing a Frisbee mm -hmm. or, or talking about a pivot foot and thinking about balance and in terms of your, of your hand or whatever. Yeah. I, I bring the, the, the actual physical concepts, but I do think that there is a, a wiring that's very similar. And I don't know if it's true. I hope it's true. Uh, yeah. But there's a story that Yana Starker and Bobby Knight at IU would take each other's, would go guest speak in front of each other's groups. And so Bobby Knight would say, if you think I make you guys work hard, check out this guy. And there Starker would do the exact same, <laughs> same thing you bring in Bobby, if you think. Uh, yeah, the, the sports, I think it's, it's kind of a worn cliche, but I think there actually is a lot of fertile soil in there. Clearly, as you say, the discipline, and, and I'm, I'm sad now, my, my kids are both swimmers, which is great. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, you have to choose your one sport, and you must do it all year round to be competitive. You know, where I, back in my day, again, for, especially for girls, there really wasn't anything, there wasn't a three-year-old soccer league. You know, you really didn't do anything until you got to high school if you were a girl, and you played the sport in season, as I said, and they were quite limited. There was no soccer in the fall, there was no lacrosse so you know I'm from the northeast I played field hockey you know things like I mean it was it was a little simpler <laughs> and you played that till the season was over and then you yeah, went to basketball and you know so it, it there was so, a different different kind of headset about being so driven as you say I think I think there is a lot of sense of you could get that scholarship you know to mm -hmm. college to do this thing and um so as you've watched different generations of students come through your own studios and your classrooms have you seen people, have, have you seen the generations of kids get more and more specialized or do they have broader interests? I think, I think it's, I think it's changed over time. And I think there's, there's pressure of, a, of getting a job and there's parental pressure about mm -hmm. having a degree that gets you a job. When I was in, when I went to college, you, you went for what you were passionate about. You didn't really think about outcomes. You didn't think about will I have a job as an orchestral player, let's say. You didn't, you didn't think about those things. Mm -hmm. You went, and, and parents typically were very supportive of that. And then I think there was a period of time, and I see this because I've been a college educator for a long time now, you know, close to 30, over 30 years now. And I think there was a period of time where, where music enrollment declined because I think parents were like, oh, you know, you're not going to get a job doing that. So you're, I'm not going to, we're not going to support you. Mm -hmm. So you need to do something else. And, you know. And I think it has swung back a little bit where I think parents understand that almost no degree now is a sure mm -hmm. thing for a job. So you should probably do something you love, but hey, how about doing something in addition to it that makes you career ready in case that doesn't work out? You know, and I, that's where I think a school like Butler is really, does a really great job where we say, you know, we're, we're not a conservatory. We have a, students who play well enough to go to a conservatory, but we understand that it's more about the discipline, let's say in music, the discipline of being a musician and the love and the passion and the, the love of beauty and emotion, you know, and all of those sort of, those, you know, kind of transient kind of, mm -hmm. that's not the right word, but the, the skills, you know, that are hard to quantify make you a better citizen of the world. And then meanwhile, maybe you double major with actuarial science and you go off and you're an actuary, but you'll buy a ticket to come here, 
you know, the Rochester Philharmonic play a, a, a piece, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, I think, I think there's been a, a clear swing. Do you think that that's a good selling point then for humanities is that, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on, I know, academic programs to meet STEM yeah. uh, requirements and a lot of political pressure, especially in state schools, and that they're the, the advocates for STEAM uh, curriculum. Yeah. When I think about a lot of like law students or, you know, you think like I even think about earlier generations that would get degrees in history. And that was like a pretty natural progression into the law, something that was seen as respectable and practical and useful. Um, do you think that when there's downward pressure on the humanities sort of culturally, that a, this is a good way to make an argument for them, that these are, you know, that we need better people. I mean, look around us right now. We need better citizens. Yes. Yeah, I think I think so, Rob. Absolutely, and I think you know there was there were studies I haven't looked recently, but there were studies, for example, where more music majors were accepted into medical school than biology majors. Interesting, because of that, the very thing you're you're speaking about the 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 empathy, the teamwork, the discipline, the attention to detail that musicians have, for example, has been greatly valued by medical schools, for example. So when you look at what employers value in their new hires, you know, what, what's right at the top now is le- leading is often creativity, mm. followed by communication skills, whether it be written, whether it be oral, whether it be whatever, uh, problem solving, which we know is design thinking and, t- you know, and we know as musicians is, is problem solving when you're practicing, you know, uh, not just playing it a hundred times, but what do I not like? What, what am I going to do? What's my checklist? Which hand is the problem? What am I going to do? Um, Interesting. So I, I, uh, when I was in Louisville, um, I went to see the president of the university speak a number of times, Neela Bendapudi. She's an amazing, amazing person. Uh, and she talked about how all schools are in competition for global talent. And they're just, and they're in a race for talent, both internally, so within their faculty and student body, but also to bring and retain talent in the city. So I'm curious then, when you're, when you're looking at uh, prospective students, are you thinking that long-term in terms of who you would admit? Are you thinking, oh, this person might make a great violinist, but they might also make a great community leader. They might make a great med student. They might make X, Y, Z. That might not be music related. I, I think we're moving in that direction. I can't honestly, as much as I would love to say, oh yes, that's exactly what we do. I can't. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish we would do more of that. And in fact, to, to take that into a music specific notion in terms of trying to diversify our student body. I mean, Butler is a predominantly white institution, which has great designs about becoming more diverse. Were, were those designs in place before this summer? I mean, or this is, yeah. a, is and so COVID probably has accelerated that. Yeah, I, I, they've been in place since I arrived here 25 years ago. In fact, in a lot of ways, we're having the same conversations about becoming more diverse than we were having back then. But they've become, after all the racial tension this summer, they've become different kinds of conversations, which is great. So why did outcomes, why do you think outcomes and intentions didn't align for those 25 years? Because I learned this super cool new term at a conference I went to called rhetorical diversity. What does we, that mean? It means you can talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. I mean, right. like, there we go. We're a white. We're a bu- typically it's a bunch of white people sitting around a table talking about wouldn't it be great to be more diverse. We should be more diverse, and and trying to to imagine what that means for not only a, a, let's say a black student, but a black mm-hmm. faculty member. It, it's not just about somehow enticing them to come here. How, how do we support them when they're here? And how would I possibly know that? You know, as a white woman of privilege, how, how would I possibly know mm-hmm. how to support? a female black student who's here. How, how would I know that? So we, I think we, we've moved along to the point of, we're, we're actually making some pretty great strides, but this notion of rhetorical diversity, we talk about how we long for this thing and then there's no action. And there's certainly no sustainable action. You know, let's, let's, let's inventory what we do on campus. Great. What does that mean? What does inventory on campus mean? 20 years ago, I've been trying to let's let's look at what courses and programs we offer that have some kind of component of diversity to them. You know, and it's kind of like an NASM land, you know, as an accredited institution. There was a point when NASM said, you need to teach world music and all music schools were like, got it. And so we created a global music course that we tacked onto the curriculum. Done. You know what I mean? It was kind of like 
done. There was this superficial level of dialogue or let's inventory what we do. Look at our inventory. Yeah. And, and now what's, what's the next step? When you talk about being sustainable, how about how, how many, how many black composers are you programming? Mm-hmm. How about that? And then so not you- inventory, but then actually saying, I'm going to commit that 25% of our programming next season is going to be by composers of color. Like how do you take, how do you turn the inventory, which makes you feel like you did something, how do you turn it into something actionable? I know that a big part of your academic career has been to, uh, to bring new courses to the curriculum. So are you as a, as a institutional leader now is a way to expand this inventory to empower faculty to be more creative in the way they design their, their, exactly. their coursework? Exactly. So about a year and a half ago, I created a, a social justice task force in our college. And one of the committees on that task force is a curriculum committee, and they are working actively to do this very thing, Rob, to say, okay, there's this great quote from a colleague here in town who teaches at a different institution. And he says, you know, when you're, when you're talking about this kind of discussion with curriculum, let's say, let's try to put diverse culture into the curriculum. He would argue, no, you need to put your curriculum into the culture. Mm. Can you explain? And, so how does that, how does that look different? I think, I think you have to be prepared to throw it all out. Throw out all the curriculum. And rethink. Now, okay. are we ever going to do that? No, of course not. But I mean, the reality is you have to be ready to do that. You have to say, okay, like for me, I push the music faculty all the time and I'm not, I, and they, they're with me, but they're, they're, they're afraid. And why are we still teaching music history, for example, at, at Butler? It's a three semester survey, early music, medieval Renaissance, and then like Baroque classical, and then like romantic 20th century, 20th, 21st century, and then your semester of music in a global context. Why are we still doing that? I, I've gone in to watch the, not so much the anymore, but the, originally when we had the global music context, I would go in and, you know, this week it's Chinese music. Really? Chinese, the, the music of China in like right. <laughs> I'm really, and you know, the lecture I went, it was about the time period where they were talking about how the music was very similar to what was happening in the courts of Europe. And I'm thinking, then why aren't we teaching all that at the same time? Why don't, why don't we teach this way instead of, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, so when I say throw it all out, I would love to see our music history faculty come to, with a proposal to the school of music and curriculum lives with the faculty. So I can't interfere too much. I can mm-hmm. nudge and prod and say, hey, but ultimately, I would love to see a proposal come forward about how they might realign this traditional sequence into something more comprehensive and more interesting. As you guys reimagine the curriculum this way, does, does it ever come up in, in tension or in conflict with accreditation, like accreditation standards? It, I wouldn't say there, there's, there's an eye to standards. I wouldn't say there's tension. Okay. NASM especially, I mean, I, I'm a visiting evaluator for NASM too, so I go to other schools as well. They, they're pretty good about allowing institutions to kind of define what works for them. I mean, yes, there are some general mm-hmm. standards that you have to adhere to, but they're also pretty, they're becoming increasingly flexible about how each school could choose to define that. I would imagine though that it's a perpetual problem of how do you fit in, you know, several hundred years of even Western music into right. a curriculum. Yep. And I would imagine the danger is that everything gets thinned out even, even further, right? If, as, you, as you include more stuff. So does the Butler School of Music or does the arts program in general have, for instance, a large foreign born population? Um, no, not at Butler. I, our dance program is probably, again, in, in my college, I oversee music, dance, theater, art, and mm-hmm. arts administration. Our dance program, which is one of the top in the country, our ballet program, is often considered top five in the country. They are very, you know, for a hundred and some dancers, they come from 30 different states and probably three or four different countries. Mm-hmm. So they are by far the most diverse. Um, I was just trying to think, would where the students come from influence the curriculum at all? I don't think so. I don't, I don't know that it should. I don't. Yeah, know. I don't think it should but either. I'm just curious if that was even. A, I mean, just trying to think of the ways that one might um, prioritize, because it's so hard to to substitute things, and right. giving up something comes with a cost. Right. Especially, you have to keep an eye on 
being accepted to graduate school and having a certain foundational base of knowledge that we would expect if you're, if you're on an audition committee in your orchestra and you, you would expect that your auditionees would have a certain understanding of the music of Beethoven. So we can't just like skip Beethoven because we need to get to you know something else here. So we're, I think that that's the bigger tension is, is what do we expect a graduate who potentially is going to go on to graduate school, potentially even a doctoral program, what do we expect them Mm -hmm. to know. However, I, I still, you know, another, another way one could consider music history curriculum, for example. What if, the, what if the traditional European survey was actually downsized? You know, what was something that we were talking about prior to becoming the dean, I was the head of our school of music and something we were looking at was maybe instead of three semesters in a world music, what if it were a two semester traditional survey, which again is a race, I get it, it's a race through, but with, you know, with Wikipedia and frankly with YouTube, you know, there, there's a lot less pressure to show everything in class when at the touch of your fingertips, mm -hmm. you can go explore whatever you need, right? That's a change too. And then, and then maybe have a series of classes that are topical. Like how could you relate Baroque music to the notion of the composer artist or the entrepreneurial spirit of the Baroque era? How could you, how could you say like, the romantic era and political, you know, nationalism or tension in, in politics or so, you know, how, how could you take like a big social topic and marry it to a, a period of time and look at music from in that way, rather than the traditional trudge through, you know, oh, the mm -hmm. Rococo, really? Do we really need to, you know, and, we, and we've done some of that in theory. We've done a pretty good job in our music theory sequence, which I think is way more, you know, where, where I, I just, when I was chair of music, I said to the head of our music theory, why, why do you spend almost the entire first semester in part writing? Not that and, you should skip it, but do you really need to spend, I said, you know, at that point I was like in my fifties, I'm a professional violinist. I have never <laughs> used the knowledge about part writing in my professional career. Do so you think that... Do you, do you think that's an would be a, uh, something to survey of sorts would be to say what have most mid career musicians taken with them to school or taken with them from school? Exactly. Oh, well, I, clearly. What and what could you have? You know, what what did we not teach you? What did we spend time on that we could have just you know and and maybe directed you some way to look it up if you're interested go do this thing you know um, but oh oh yeah and we've done that we've done that with our alums in the area of entrepreneurship and career readiness but we haven't done it so much in content but I think that would be a fascinating thing hmm. globally to do I think that'd be really really an interesting national yeah program. you know when I think back to my own training it was so violin specific that. I don't really feel like I took a lot of academic work away from my six years in college. I can't honestly say that I have applied any of it consciously. I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, of course, some, some theory and stuff. I almost wonder if um, that would have been more successful had it gone deeper in a more narrow space. I, I think you're exactly right. Rob, and I think, I think that's what our theory area is trying to do. They're, they're, they're actually focusing more now on having students bring into the classes works that they're working on and use them as the springboard for, you know, why in the, let's say you're working on the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, why do you linger on this note? Oh, it's because of some kind of harmonic, ten you know, do you know what I mean? Like putting it immediately into practice rather than, than talking about and analyzing these sort of, you know, abstract concepts, let's take it directly to the music. And again, I've gone in and watched these kids and I, I mean, I hear first semester freshmen talking about music in ways that I, I wouldn't have had any idea how to talk about. I mean, talking about music. Like on a technical level? Yeah, being able to, and, and, and like with excitement, you know, and talking about, you know, I mean, I happened to go in, they were talking about, um, I think, non-harmonic tones and suspensions, and the kids were like, you know, and the prof was like, what, what kind of like suspension should we, and they were like, oh, let's do it, you know, and they were just like, oh, okay, what would I need to do? You know, I mean, it was just like to listen to them talk about music, was just so refreshing. I mean, I mean, not, not I mean, not, never had those conversations again in their life in terms of mm -hmm. talking about suspension. Like, but, but to hear them, like, you know, I don't know about you, but like when I would have learned about suspensions in in theory class, I would have just been like, you know, we'd be looking at example <laughs> three point two, and you should have a B in the base against the thing, and you, you know, you would have just been like, like this. And these kids were just, you know, it was it was super exciting mm -hmm. to me. You know, as you're talking about what the next, the downstream expectations are for students, 
you know, in my business, we talk, or my side of the business, we talk a lot about the pipeline, you know, the, the pipeline that comes up. And again, I don't think we have a tremendous expectation on, as an orchestra committee or audition committee, we place everything on the audition, probably unfortunately. I mean, that's, but as I've said many times in my career and on this podcast that the, the system tends to work, like it works more often than it doesn't, the blind audition process that is. Sure. And produces the results that we want. Um, I think where we get into uh, the deficits of the pipeline, rather than it being like a, like a virtuous circle <laughs> of like long-term learning is that the, the, most of my colleagues, I would say the majority have master's degrees, at least. I certainly all have undergraduate degrees in music or, or undergraduate degrees and master's degrees. And even in that four to six years is actually probably too short amount of time to really be ready for the, for the marketplace. But as the people tend to age in to the profession, um, the lack of uh, curiosity, perhaps, that's yeah. been fostered. And I was thinking about, as you were talking about the, the departments that you oversee, has being responsible to a degree for dance and theater and art and music, um, has that inspired you to tr- try and make the departments of the school more integrated in that there'd be more interaction between the students and the faculty in those departments? I always think back to my own, if that if I had been more immersed in the, the literature and the arts, uh, the other arts, that I would be a more rounded musician. Yes, absolutely. We have, we have this real it's a treasure. This college, I mean, I'm so privileged to be the dean of this college with over 400 students. And, you know, the, the, the challenge is, of course, schedule and time, mm-hmm. especially the ballet program is so, you know, again, just a BFA in performance. And most many of our, of our grads go directly into professional dance companies. And, and um, I mean, even coming up here, even in the midst of COVID, I'm just having an email chain about, you know, that our seniors are starting to be offered in-person auditions with dance companies across the country. And they, they need, they're asking if they're allowed to leave campus once we're back, you know, are there any kind of travel restrictions mm. given the face-to-face? And so I'm literally this morning, I wrote an email to the powers that be like, you know, sure, this will be the same for a business person doing an interview somewhere live, you know, but our dancers are getting ready to, to go. So it's, it's really hard for us to find the opportunities to have them intersect more. I, I have floated with my department chairs the notion of creating a series of courses in our college. It'd have to be electives probably, and when we'd offer them, this would be the, the difficult thing, but to have a series of courses that would have a topic like creation, artistic creation, and have it team taught by what, what does that mean to a composer versus a choreographer versus a, you know, theater artist or improvisation, or even just aesthetics. What is beauty? How's beauty defined in, you know, whatever, you know, just have these sort of interdisciplinary courses. So then we have interest, but again, it's sort of time and the logistics of that. The other, the other way I'm also going about it is in the area of social justice. That is clearly one big, giant, major objective mm-hmm. for me personally. And fortunately, I'm surrounded by faculty and students who want to go there with me. Um, but we are talking right now within this curriculum committee I mentioned before, I'm, I'm trying to create sort of a minor in the college or an emphasis in something called arts activism. And I'd like to create, uh, that'd be an optional thing. That would be kind of a series of a trajectory where the first semester either be like a, and I would actually like to make this a required course for all of our arts majors. There would be you know, one or two credits and so not like a big time intensive thing, but kind of an introduction to social justice because we've got kids, as you know, who don't, we have white kids who don't understand what white privilege is and think like, we don't have a lot of money. I'm not privileged. It's like, oh, yes, yes, you are. And you don't, because you don't know what that means, right? So how do we, how do we gather students and help them to start to develop that concept? And maybe, maybe at the other end, as they're ready to leave, there's some kind of a service learning community component. Because to your point, if we're going to send, like to your orchestra, the part you can audition behind the screen is, the same like with a professional athlete. We know someone that's a great athlete, but how are they going to engage with the community? How are they going to engage with their colleagues on the stage? And that's the part you can't know from an audition. We can't know that in a faculty search either until they're actually here. But we can surely try to train our students 
and help to foster them and mentor them into making a difference in the community using the arts. You know, right now in education, social emotional learning, well, the arts clearly help to teach. You know, like, how do, how do we use our arts mm-hmm. to, well, to drive change forward, right? So, so as you drive that change forward, what would you imagine that a graduate or someone that had that certification that comes out of school, what would they be armed with, maybe fairly specifically, that the regular music student, the regular college graduate wouldn't be? I mean, would there be an element of social science? Would there be a, a pedagogical uh, public speaking? I mean, what, what, what kinds of things would they have that the regular person wouldn't? I, I, I like to think all of those things that you just mentioned. I think exactly that. So you, you, you'd start by sort of understanding the problem Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, again, it's, it's like a, it's a model of design thinking in progress, right? So you, you, here's your problem is we have social injustice. So let's start by learning what that even means and develop the vocabulary to it and then have a series of courses. You know, maybe and it have to be, you know, again, just kids are so booked, you know, and mm-hmm. so many of them work three jobs to pay for college, you know, it's just, but some courses that would help to develop some of the skills you're talking about, like expanding on the idea of difference and, and culture and all of those kinds of things. So, you know, so a series of courses that lead to this idea of a mentorship uh, and our students are really, really interested, especially our students of color, dancers, for example, they, they, they want to, and we're, we're working to partner with the, the now Short Ridge High School here in town, which has, has picked up the arts magnet um, responsibilities since Broad Ripple High School closed. So the arts magnet is there and how do we we're creating like a pathway and some dual credit opportunities with them. And our students are, are so eager to be in that role, but do it in a supervised kind of way. So that to your point, when they come out, I mean, they know it, it just aren't eager to do something. They've actually already done it. They've been able to try and fail. Mm-hmm. They've been able to reflect, you know, when you think about that, again, scientific method, design thinking model that you do something, you try it and then you reflect and you try something, you know, I mean, giving, building that in. So you've actually tried something to see if it was successful and then try to analyze why it was or wasn't. I'm curious that with this um, project-based learning, does that also uh, align with maybe the university's goal to be, to have maybe more direct impact in its community? Yes. Yes, like Butler, there, you know, there is a term called the Butler bubble, which when you mm-hmm. live here, I'm not sure if you've ever heard that. I hadn't that, heard that, but I can clearly imagine what it yeah, is. It's, it's a bubble. We're the, we're the expensive, predominantly white liberal arts school in town. Great national reputation. You know, there, I, we, we, they just was a survey maybe five years ago, a community survey to see the Butler kind of commission to see how, what it was our reputation in the community compared to other institutions of higher learning here. And we were always mentioned, you know, again, arts, clearly something is sports, of course, with basketball, uh, arts, our college of ed, our school of business. But there's clearly the sense that meanwhile, we sit where we sit and we don't move into the community. And so to your point, absolutely. Butler recognizes that. We recognize that. I recognize that we need to be stepping out and how do we do that? Well, in our college, it's easy we use our arts to to mentor. Yeah, I would think that obviously the the number one place for civic communion on the Butler campus is the basketball program. Yeah. Um, But I would imagine that the arts program is the second most obvious place. And you guys have beautiful facilities. I mean, is there a push then to make programming on the campus uh, more palatable and more interesting to a broader range of folks? Yes. Yes, and I would say that that has really come about since Schrod opened and, and, and we, we took a step in the direction of arts and culture to create what we call now the Butler Arts and Events Center, where mm-hmm. we take the venues. And of course, Butler bought the, the seminary next door, uh, CTS. We, okay. we purchased their campus, right? And they had an auditorium, about a 450 seat auditorium and a beautiful chapel. So we have additional now performance venues that we own. Uh, we run them professionally, but, but to your point, Absolutely. I remember when we when we created the Butler Arts Center and we hired an executive director, we did a national search. And one of the first things he did was he decided, to your point, I would like to bring in, it's, you know, because this clues is mostly a presenting hall, as you know. And so he, he said, I think we should bring in like a, a Bollywood artist uh, star, something like that. And, and he got in his car and I'm not joking. He drove to about 30 Indian restaurants in Indianapolis and went in and asked the owners, if we brought this person, would you come? And when they all said yes, 
he booked this person, it was kind of pricey, and the event sold out in less than 48 hours. That's a 2200 seat hall, which is not huge, but I mean, it, it sold out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a, you know, one tiny example of something, but I think, I think there is a sense of we need to program to the community. I'm doing that. I did it this year, especially um, when we went sort of online. We, we always bring in guest artists as any arts school does. I said to my colleagues, okay, we're going to be online for the fall. We're going to be online, digital, digital, virtual residencies, go, who? So we had, I don't know if you're familiar with Superman. He's a, he's a Crow Indian rapper. He raps in full regalia. And so wow. we, he did a, you know, he did a pod, he did like a webinar, but he also, he, he zoomed in with our choral students to talk about Native American singing traditions. And he zoomed into all of our school of music. We have like an, a weekly convocation and talked to them about his trajectory. And, and the kids were just so engrossed. We had like 150 students and he zoomed in. The first thing he did was he's burning the sage and into the zoom he's, you know, doing with a feather. He's, he's doing it. And they were just, and he, you know, he talked about his trajectory and, and uh, what he's trying to do to help preserve that culture. So I, I, you know, every event we booked, you know, we had an anti-racist theater artist. We had uh, uh, two museum panels. One was, uh, I put it on Columbus Day, we called it Monumental Crisis. And it, two scholars whose work has been in the removal of Confederate monuments. And I put it on, as I say, on Columbus Day. That's when you I say could. a scholar in the removal of Confederate, like what was his role in that? Was he uh, like an advisor to mayors yeah, or yeah, something? They are PhD, they are scholars. They are scholars who research and uh, there were two of them. They, they research and publish about and, and research the, the sort of the motivation behind the, the removal, the reaction to what's happening to the monuments when they're taken down. There actually are people that research that. And uh, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. And there, there were two of them. We had like a panel and then they did questions and answers. But then they each zoomed into, we were teaching a museum studies class in the art department this semester. And each of them then zoomed in individually to be like a guest lecturer so that they're, you know, I want a public component, but I also want an interaction with students. And the other, the other, the art one that was interesting, there's a national movement called Museums Are Not Neutral. And it was two folks, including someone here from the Indianapolis Museum of Art, who had recently left because of, and she was very public about it, about the toxic culture there. She herself is black and, and, and writing that, that many museums are in fact very racist. So we had these two folks who had these different experiences with, with this movement and one of them is a curator at a, a movement at a excuse me a museum in Philadelphia. Um, okay, so me. I want to hear more about that, and I want to hear about how that overlaps with uh, your institution's mission. So, as an orchestra, we often think of ourselves as being fairly neutral. I mean, anyone that gives it a second's worth of thought understands that there are many layers to that. But as we live in a more and more, and maybe hope, hopefully, maybe less and less <laughs> polarized society. We do have these, some institutions, they could be a sports league, could be the, uh, maybe the NBA is not the best example right now, but like the NFL or soccer or something, they, they see themselves as somewhat apolitical, as neutral spaces where all Americans can gather and gather for the same reason and leave politics behind. As nonprofit institutions, I think that's even more in the foreground that we stay fairly, I mean, quote unquote, neutral. How do you see then that these type, whether it be a university, a symphony orchestra, art museum, how do we introduce uh, difficult conversations into our uh, presentations uh, without losing some of the good parts of being um, an apolitical organization? Well, I think, I think you make them optional, right? I think, I think to your point, so you, you pro, you're doing a Black History Month concert <clears throat> for example, as an orchestra or whatever, um, you you do a pre-concert thing, a lecture, or maybe a post-concert talk back with the performers. With the, in other words, I think I think for us, what works pretty well is to to kind of create some kind of social justice themed outreach thing uh, around you know, some kind of event, some kind of interaction. But you absolutely have to make it optional. I think this is this is the thing that's frustrating whether you're talking about, I mean, to, it's exactly to your point. Everybody needs to be welcome, but not everybody is in the same place on the social justice highway. And so mm-hmm. when you start insisting that people have to do, listen to this or dialogue that or whatever, 
that's that's proven to be ineffective, right? So it has, and, and then you say, but the but people who most need to learn are the ones who won't come. And that is exactly right. That's exactly right. So you have to you have to make the opportunities there and then you have to reach out to them. We, we, were, we were participating for a while with a group called Sustained Dialogue, which comes out of Washington, DC. And it's a dialogue training group for difficult conversations, especially racism, but any kind of difficult Com, you know, conversation. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing they said, because I was like, let's make it required every first year student, you know, and they were like, um, nope, 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 nope. Because nope. when somebody doesn't want to be there, they bring that mindset with them and they don't hear you anyway. And they have the potential to be disruptive. Sure. Disruptive. Well, let's, but let's even talk more about um, the university as a shared public space and recognize as a private institution, but as a shared public space in its, in its presenting. So I think about, you know, uh, a public library as a place where uh, people can meet for many different reasons. A public library has reinvented itself many, many times over to, uh, to understand its public value. And it's not just a place to borrow books anymore. It's, it serves many social functions. And that a symphony orchestra as an example could be a place where the programming itself gets different kinds of people to underneath the same roof at the same time. I mean, I know that we have a well-earned reputation for elitism, but I think people do actually underappreciate how many different kinds of people come to a large uh, civic institution like a symphony orchestra. Because I look out at the audience literally every weekend and I see a wide range of people. Sure you do. Yeah. I want to see a wider range of people, but it's a way for people to uh, see how different people live, see different kinds of musics. And I think about the university as um, a really fertile place for bridging and bonding, to use Robert Putnam's term um, about, uh, you know, to bridge and bond different society or different parts of society. I wonder if though that, that the university can take it actually more um, forward stance in its programming, maybe more than mandating curriculum. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that um, just yesterday, in fact, I met with a member of my dance faculty who has this idea. Are you familiar with this play, um, La Ronde? No. By Schnitzler. And it's a very provocative play. It's, a, it's, it's like 10 interactions. It has to do with, you know, frankly, with sex and with sexual encounters. And it, it's, it, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, a little bit of, of that. And yet, you know, the, this dance faculty is a new member of our dance faculty. He has this idea of how to do something kind of based off of that with, you know, with an iPhone that, that's circling and, and you would have these encounters and, you know, he has this whole, he brought this whole mechanism. He wasn't sure, like how to do this thing. And I said, well, the, how, do we, how do we bring in a member of the theater faculty? We have this brilliant scholar who could come in and unpack the play a bit. And, you know, so you're, to your point, yeah, we can do things like that because we're not reliant on ticket income, mm. right? You're reliant on ticket income. Yeah, we sell and a lot of tickets. And, and, and so that's why we, we, can do, we did a Nutcracker in the fall. We did it to an empty house, but we did a live recorded Nutcracker that was full length, masked dancers. We had to, no touching, no kids, whatever. But we were able to do it because we didn't care that the hall was empty. Who were the stakeholders within the, that you were trying to reach with that? The kids, okay. pedagogically. Our students oh, yeah, needed to do a nutcracker. And, and so that's the point. We can shift to think about that. We can, we can program. I mean, when the audience can come with us, that's great. But our first and foremost commitment is what are the pedagogical concerns for our students? And they needed to do a nutcracker. We had the largest incoming arts class we've ever had at JCA this, this fall. Just when I thought nobody's going to go to school for the arts because of the pandemic. We have the largest class. Sure. Here. So had you already accepted that class before the shutdown? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, so I shouldn't say that. Shouldn't say that. We, we had accepted many of them because mm -hmm. we shut down like everybody else in March, about mid-March. But as we watched the deposits and we said, wow, we have a lot of deposits. How many of them are actually going to show up though? You would think yeah. there'd be a lot of deferrals at exactly. the very least. Exactly. So what do you attribute that to? Like, what do you attribute the success to? I have no idea. I think in the dance department, we normally hope for 25 students, right? That's, that would be our optimal class size. And we use audition 350 kids. We hope for 25. We have 50 first year students. And I think they came to, many of them came to school because we lose students, not generally to other dance programs. We lose them to professional companies. Sure, sure. They go we young. did lose two over the summer. We were supposed to have 52. We did lose two to professional companies over the summer, but 50 kids came because I think they felt like, oh, well, you know, a lot of dance companies aren't doing stuff. Maybe I'll just go to school after all. And, you know, I, and, 
This is, I, I had a, a previous guest was a, a dancer that I actually met through some online learning during the pandemic. And she had been a member of the Sarasota Ballet, uh -huh. uh, su super bright. And, and uh, I, I asked her to be on the, on the uh, podcast because in the class, she was the best economic student. She was explaining it <laughs> to the rest of us with incredible clarity. So I wanted to understand her role a little bit more. But what I'm wondering actually is because the dancer's uh, professional shelf life is actually quite short. Right. Uh, is there a more developed sense of what you're going to do after the fact? I mean, does the dance program prioritize um, the, the life after the art form so that they're actually a little bit more sophisticated in that kind of thinking? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, we offer a BFA in dance performance. We have a lot of students walk in the door in that degree. And then in their second or third year, we also offer a, a Bachelor of Arts option in dance. It's a pedagogy focus for those people who want to teach ballet, maybe mm -hmm. have their own studio. We also have an arts administration track in dance. And I say that because, for example, we had a, a group called Paradance here a couple, about three years ago, a professional company from New York. We have two alums in that group. And one of them dances professionally in the group, but she was an arts admin major here. And when she's not working, because it's not a full-time thing, she works for ABT as an arts administrator. So she, you know, I, I, think, I think we have a lot of dancers. I would say some of uh, the last two years, probably some of our most talented dancers were actually arts administration majors. But they then went into professional comedy. In fact, several in Louisville. We have several Butler alums in Louisville, LA. And there was one year where the two top dancers in the class, this was just maybe two years ago, they were both arts and men majors. They both went to Louisville. So they have, you know, they have that business piece in there. They have, you know, some other, to your point, they have other skills embedded in their degree plan, but they can still dance. It, it would be like being a violin major and, and double majoring in, in economics or something, whatever, mm -hmm. business, something. So you can, you know, to your point, you only care about how well they play. But then meanwhile, if you wanted to walk away, you have this other whole, you know, bundle of skills. Tucked yeah, away. What, we're, what we're talking a lot about uh, in my slice of the business is the kind of overlap between not so much artistic administrator slash performing artist, but more teaching artist slash performing artist. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the folks coming out of major conservatories that win jobs in, in the 50 or so big American orchestras, we're not, and I speak for myself entirely, like you either have a latent talent for for communicating with people and talking with people and being comfortable with people. But that's about all the training brings to it, which yeah. is to say barely anything. And that, um, so for instance, Louisville this year, there have been, uh, I mean, I, I can I only know this because I through the podcast, but there's some partnership with the University of Louisville in terms of uh, music therapy and yeah. trying to incorporate those skills. But I would imagine that, you know, running an orchestra is very, very complicated. And uh, every role is carrying a lot of water. Um, but where, where I would love to see in that pipeline, virtuous circle, metaphor, whatever, is that we come out with uh, players that are just more comfortable outside of their particular role. I have a, uh, a, a friend, friend, acquaintance who has a really um, respectable and very uh, good career as a singer songwriter. And his background, though, actually is in theater. And I think that both in terms of his uh, nuance with language, that that's important. And his songwriting, I mean, he's a gorgeous lyricist. Um, but also his stage presence is so much informed by being um, in front of an audience and s just speaking. And yeah. I think that uh, that's something that even the performance track could do a much better job of. Yeah. And I, I think, again, it, it, I think that's where a liberal arts school has an advantage. You might argue that we don't have the talent or the depth of talent that a conservatory does. But I think that we have, so for example, to your point that you just made, in our music school, every student takes what is called self-representation for musicians. And so they have to, they'll leave, it's a speaking class mm -hmm. with the notion of think of all the ways you speak, whether it's speaking from the stage at a performance or like, you know, I do the pre-concert talks for the you know, ensemble music society, or you're, you know, you're a music ed student, you're speaking to the school board about your program or, you know, whatever, there's a speaking piece and you have to have an e-portfolio. You have to have a, you know, website or an e-portfolio. So that course is designed that no music student, I don't care if you're performing, it doesn't matter what you are, walks out the door with those things. And we're looking to expand that even further with a kind of a new career development program we're going to probably put in place next fall where, where you would walk out door with those things, but you'd also walk out with something like, um, 
an or, uh, you know, music resume and a non-music resume and a music cover letter and a non-music cover letter. Um, because I, yeah, I know that we have all the transferable skills. I want to see it on a resume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to see what that looks like on a resume. We know it's valued and abstractly that's fascinating, but I want to, I'm a cynic. I want to see it in writing to know, and I want you to have it so that when you go to apply for a job to pay your rent while you're doing whatever you're doing, you have something that captures the success that you had in your discipline before you walk out the door. So we're, we're in the works with that right now. And, and also things like tax preparation. You know, we, we have a whole bunch of online modules that we're developing and, and that a student would need to take X, they can pick the, you must take these two or three and then you can pick other things, but things like tax stuff and budgeting, personal budgeting and mm -hmm. you know things that kids, and, that, and this is where, where we did actually uh, survey our alums to say, what did you not know? And the tax thing came up so much, Interesting. Um, you know, so we're, we're trying to take some steps to that. But, but to your point too, about being a teaching artist, I mean, that's something that I'm, I'm working with uh, young audiences, arts for learning here in town. They want to credential their teaching artists because your point is well taken. Somebody can be really, you know, effusive and great at what they do and never have studied anything about walking into a classroom. Or if you're really doing arts integration, it's not just me playing my violin and we're, I'm teaching them one math class about fractions and half of the string does the, you know, that's great. That's not really arts integration. Arts integration is me sitting down with the math teacher and we're designing a curriculum together that, that marries math and music together mm -hmm. because we know kids will retain it longer if it's truly integrated, right? But a lot of the teaching artists don't have any training other than just their own chops and their, as you say, their sort of innate personality skills and communicative skills, which are critical, but that's not enough anymore. And yeah, especially but anyone, no matter their raw talent can be developed. And if you have, and if you're not comfortable with it, you can still get to a baseline exactly. um, that we're not getting to. I think part of it though, and I'm speaking fairly personally, um, it comes with a shift in priorities, I think, in the sense that of how you see your institution you know, I, I've, I've never been totally bought in to the great, like capital G, capital A, great art idea. Right? I've never, never really, I've always wanted to be good at the violin. I've always wanted to be perceived as being good at the violin. And I wanted to have a career um, playing music as well as I could, but I never attached it to a sort of a, a, a high noble art purpose. You know, I've been in the business now for almost 20 years. I would say about after my first 12 or so, I really just started to see the civic institution, the civic part of its role as being important. And I would say the 2016 election pushed me off a cliff in terms of yeah. kind of putting it complete, putting the great art idea completely in the review mirror and that everything has to be focused on um, community building. I mean, at the end of the day, we are, we're not touring artists by and large, even the Cleveland orchestra, it plays a vast, vast majority of its concert in Cleveland. You know, they're, they're and as much as any group they're on the road. Um, but an orchestra like mine, we play most of our concerts in the state uh, and most of our concerts here in Rochester and in the same important downtown building. And uh, when you stop thinking about the art side of it quite as fervently then you're able to see that, oh, I, might, I be, might be a good teacher. I might be really good at preparing kids for uh, orchestra auditions or for their college auditions and stuff. I mean, I don't do much of that. I do a lot of coaching. Yes, yeah. I used to before the pandemic. Um, uh, a lot of coaching for people going on to the next thing, whatever that was. One off, two off lessons, things like that. But I recognize I'm a terrible teaching artist. I have like no idea what I'm doing. And so whatever skills, I might have this status in this one area, but very little in the other. And uh, I'm working on developing that. But I just love to see our new hires be a little bit farther down that road than I was. Uh, it took me a decade to, or a decade or more to get into that mind frame. Sure. And I, I think that, that, as you say, that's the opportunity for colleges and universities. And it's especially an opportunity for a liberal arts school to not have to worry about producing. I mean, if, if, if we produce a great violinist who's gonna go have a career, great, and we've done that. But that's not our focus. Our focus mm -hmm. is to this other thing, to build the individual, you know, and, and really focus on the critical thinking skills and the, and the you know, discernment and, and you know, renewed focus on information literacy, <laughs> how to trust a sword, you know, things like that. We, we can do that because we have the curriculum in place to enable us to, to do that, you know, I've, I've last three years, I was on the national committee for Fulbright's to evaluate Fulbright applications for strings. 
And so I had the opportunity over those three years to see a lot of transcripts from a lot of schools. And I can tell you, you know, some conservatory, you know, when you look at the transcript from someone from certain kinds of conservatories, certain kinds of, and I don't mean that in any disparaging mm -hmm. way, there's not much there, you know, <laughs> there's not much there. There's a lot of performance study and yay. And they brilliant performers, mm -hmm. brilliant. And there's not much else there. And the, and the thing is we almost never, it, it, correspondingly, the proposals were not very strong. I know you want to go take violin lessons in France, but you, that's not the, you know, the Fulbright doesn't live or die by wanting to take violin lessons in France and study some obscure piece with some teacher that, you, you know, that is so lame. That is, you know, there's no sense of how to, how to look deeper, how to mm -hmm. think deeper. I mean, the, that process, there has to be community engagement. There has to be, what are you going to do when you come back? How do you, you know, and these proposals were poorly written and these folks did not have the chops. I, I want to, tie this back to you a little bit. You, you said a minute ago, you and talking about the transferable skills, allegedly, <laughs> the transferable skills of musicians. What in your own change that you made from being a teacher to being an administrator and then on to being a dean? I think about in my own career, I've been approached a number of times to move into management and as a, a good union member, I've always I've always said no. Um, but I've all this work. It's obviously more complicated than that. But I, I I'm curious about uh, moving away from the the classroom, from the private studio, and how was what was that transition like for you? And what skills did you bring to it? What was and what was really surprising about it? I don't know about skills. It's maybe more personality traits for me. Uh, when I was a, a faculty member, when I was a violin faculty member, first of all, I, you know, again, having gone to West Virginia, not having gone to a conservatory, I always had the academic spirit. So I developed when we, especially when we first came here, you know, we didn't have a full studio. Somebody had to teach music appreciation. I'm like, I'll do that, you know, and ultimately I, I loved that. And I, you know, and I eventually went up to Lincoln Center and worked with their teaching artist because I could see how that could influence, you know, their, their arts integration approach, which is unique and different from the Kennedy Centers, let's say. I, I like, I loved that. You know, but it's just that, you know, I think that's more of a personality kind of trait. But the other, the one that I think pointed me towards administration was that I'd become very easily annoyed with things. Um, it, it, so in other words, you know, it's, in these faculty meetings, we talk about some frustrating thing that happens and it would just be like, well, why don't we just do this other thing? Like, why don't we not do it that way? Why don't we do this other way? And then by the next faculty meeting, you know, I could see people were interested, but there's that. I would like write it down and say, it, what if we tried this for a semester? And if it didn't work, we could go back to what we're doing. And, and you know, so you start, it, it's, it's like your own personal annoyance at something that you start to try to fix. Did you ever have a situation though, where as a, as a violin faculty member and at, perhaps as a classroom teacher, that you saw something over and over again that was frustrating to you and you thought could be done differently. But then as you got into an administrative role, you saw that that thing was done that way for at least a, for a, a reasonable reason? Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, you know, the, the, and, and so if that's the case, great, then that's how we have to do it. But then maybe we need to articulate something about it differently so it, it's not as frustrating. Or it was done for that reason 15 years ago mm -hmm. and the world has changed and we have not adapted since then. And, you know, and then hold it into the fact that universities move at the pace of you know, syrup. It took me, one of, the first, one of the first things I did when I became Dean, I was like, why are our dancers having to take a PE class? <laughs> right, right? So in order for me to remove that from their degree plan, it took me, Rob, no kidding, it took me three years because that was a change of the core curriculum. So this was like, oh, it, you know, here, here, here's mm -hmm. the document. It, it, like it's a change. I said, yeah, I know, like bring it, you know, and I have not put off my paperwork. Bring it here. <laughs> yep. Three years it took. So temperamentally then, um, you, you may be a reformer, but you're institutionalist in that you are able to, I mean, you have to, at some level, it's going to work at incremental pace. I mean, yeah. a large institution is going to, almost by definition. Yeah. So was that the strongest characteristic you think you brought to um, this, this job is having sort of a long-term vision and the patience to get there? Yeah. And, and being, uh, you know, I, I, and I don't mean this about myself, but having a sense of being a little bit fearless. And as I say, just not being put off, like, yeah, it's a big deal. Like right now, what I was doing before we started talking, I'm working on revising our tenure and promotion guidelines. Why? Because it's about a 24 page bewildering document. 
And, you know, the other colleges have like three page documents. And, you know, we have like a 24 and I'm just like, why, why? And, 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 and so it's not just because I'm like, oh, I need to fix that for the sake of fixing it. It's because when our candidates come up, they are themselves bewildered. So it's bewildering in a non-helpful kind of way. Mm -hmm. If it were crystal clear and we got it, it is, you know, so to me, that's just, and I'll do it myself. That's something that normally at the Dean level, you just say to someone else, hey, I need you to do this thing. The other thing I want to mention too is to something you mentioned earlier. I never have stopped teaching, Rob. I have seven violin students. And I think that that's important in my role. I think it's important in the Dean role. And my Dean colleagues across the, the, across the campus do it as well. If you don't, you just completely lose touch with the very folks you're advocating for, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't continue to teach, I still have two advisees. I, I'm an academic advisor for because I, I need to keep my fingers in that pie. And in the fall with the pandemic, we all had to step up and teach an overload. I taught a, a, a music, the one music history course that all dancers take. So I had 50 first year dancers in a class, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, at eight o'clock in the morning to teach them what they need to know about music history as dancers and as potential choreographers. And I loved it. I'm really, I'm glad to hear that, obviously. And we got to know each other primarily through the commercial music scene in, uh, in Indianapolis. So yeah. are you, do you, do you still perform? Do you still have time to work? As a, as a, player? a little bit, a little bit. Uh, uh, it's harder and harder. You sure. know, I still play in the chamber orchestra, which, you know, is very minimal. Um, just played on Christmas Eve, played some quartets over at the museum there a couple days ago. Um, it's harder and harder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm, I'm sad about that. I'm sad about it. And yet I am also, you know, I'm also okay with that. I mean, I play enough because I think it gives me, again, it gives me credibility, like with my students, you know, we played in the studio together. We sat so many times together mm -hmm. and I can say to them, you're never going to get hired with that kind of rhythm. You're just not going to get hired. And, and, and I can say it because I just did it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, so I think it, it gives me some credibility in some kind of way. Um, with my students or if they see me, I don't, I don't sub much with the ISO anymore. Um, but you know, when I did or with the chamber, mm -hmm. so like they, they see me on the stage, so they understand that I'm still, you know, in it at some level. Well, Lisa, I think this is a pretty, pretty good place to wrap up. Do you have any recommendations on things to check out books, music, anything like that? Sure. Well, and last night movie, if you're interested in movie, Absolutely. That, films too. Yeah. last night, uh, Davis and I watched the departed. I don't know if you ever saw that one. It's one of those. Like, Listen, as a proud son of Massachusetts, that is uh, a formative movie for me. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I, you know, and then in terms of reading, I'm reading a book called uh, Sophie's World. Do you know that one? I don't. It's a, it's a novel, um, but it's about the history of philosophy written in kind of a novel form. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But also, I, I, I tend to also be reading nonfiction as I know that's what you read a lot of as well. And there, there's a book and I wrote down the full title so I don't forget it. A book by Jonathan Metzl, Dying of Whiteness, mm. How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. And, and this is the deaths of despair. Yeah. And so I just started, but it's, it's. Happening. Do you think that that is um, particularly important for someone working in Indianapolis and in that, in, or in Indiana where these, where these, uh, where that cancer of uh, addiction and stuff has grown, particularly in that part of the country? I think so. I think so. And, and because, you know, look, universities lean left. We know that they lean left, but that doesn't mean we don't have some very conservative students and faculty colleagues here and staff it, understanding where that comes from and, and being inclusive for them too. Mm -hmm. that, that often is a, a problem for conservative students feel like they can't speak up in class because their liberal prof is going to make them feel bad and their, their colleagues are going to, you know, we, we need to be inclusive for them as well. And so I think to understand what drives it, where it comes from is, is pretty critical. Well, the dying of whiteness idea seems like it would hopefully transcend partisanship, right? It's not an ideological thing. So if you would imagine, I would, I would imagine the, the opioid epidemic as a, uh, is a social justice issue on itself. I mean, if you imagine that there's a public value thing, which is that we all, as a society, we all interact with that thing. And then there's a social justice thing, which is focused on a particular community. And the particular community in this case could be um, people suffering from opioid addiction or any kind of addiction yeah. that is decreasing life expectancy. Um, no, I think that's interesting. I mean, I, especially a part in Indiana with the um, hollowing out of manufacturing. These are these are that's a that's a hot button issue there. Is that the kind of thing you'd want your students to interact with more, like that kind of literature? 
yeah and and we're we're trying to think how to do that again to, boy time is the precious commodity isn't mm -hmm. it but you know having a, a a book club and and for faculty too this isn't even just a student issue in fact our students of color here say that mostly they're uncomfortable more they're just as uncomfortable uh comes discomfort comes from their faculty yeah, you know, I, I would imagine a book a book club would be a really great sort of shared experience, shared enterprise yeah. across an institution. And if every part of the school uh, contributed its its perspective um, to that, that could be a great uh, community yeah. building thing too. Yeah, and then just for fun, you know, you, something if you haven't watched the Queen's Gambit, you have to watch that. You probably already watched that. That's I a haven't, but I will. I'll take your word for it. Great. <laughs> I might go back and rewatch The Departed tonight. Though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was. We were just like on the edge of our, you know, how's this going to end kind of thing. I thought it was great. Oh, it's a fantastic movie. Well, Lisa, thank you very much. I appreciate your making time. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you all the very best up there in Rochester. Thank you for listening. The music on this show, as always, is by Craig Wagner from Louisville, Kentucky. We'll be back soon with more interviews. The next one will feature Sarah Whitney, violinist in Sybarite 5 and founder of The Productive Musician. So please go ahead and hit subscribe.